I see nowadays I'm paranoid Hooded up, ducking out the way that the cameras point Disgraced by the tabloids Cause they say we don't have a choice But, but, who are they to tell us What's fact from fiction A rise in gas emissions See rash decisions Malnutrition and maddie pictures They say it'll change when they catch the villains Well, with Saddam it didn't Still Bin Laden's hidden It don't make a scrap of difference The UN still dictate to the Palestinians Tanks are driven and relieved of their ammunition Bombs ain't bad for business 17 years and now half of Iraq is missing Do not be surprised by Bombs in the pipeline Watch when the time's right You're gone bye-byes Welcome to the zeitgeist Modern day Einsteins All seeing eye signs Stay within the guidelines The ID card ain't far from the microchips They plan to implant inside your wrist and what really are alliances of dominant nations? They're calling the council on foreign relations. Get used to the fact they got troops in Iraq. And they're gonna be there till they remove all the gas. The larger degrees of commander in chiefs. And private militaries that are armed to the teeth. Men in white coats that shoot particle beams. Annihilate any single target they please. Ladies and gentlemen, David Icke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, what an amazing day, what an amazing event. We've got people here from uh, India, Finland, Sweden, Canada, America. <laughs> and all over Britain. And all that stuff. Iceland, yeah, Iceland, yeah. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank all the crew who've made this possible to JP and Sean. Thank you. And, and, and to Dave, Dave Elliott and, and all, all the crew that have made this possible. And also to Bill. Bill has come all the way from America. He's a, a, an American professional TV cameraman. And he's come over here to uh, work on this event just because he believes in what we're trying to do. So thanks for Bill to coming, for coming. Thank you. And also in the audience, somewhere out there, because it all looks black to me, um, is uh, a lady called Yeva. Are you there, Yave? There, she's over there. 
Yeva uh, used to travel with me uh, back in the days when I used to arrive in an event, I'd put the chairs out, Yave would sit to take the, the tickets from people, um, she wouldn't take many tickets, you know, sometimes eight or nine, they'd sit in the, in the seats, I'd talk for hours, and then uh, they'd leave and I'd put the chairs out and me and Yave would go and have a little chef or something, um, saying, what's it all about, Yave? What's the point, Yave? Well, this is the point. Because if you keep going and keep passionately uh, moving forward for what you believe in, the tide uh, or, or the, the sea does tend to open. It's when you think, oh, no, big problem, feel sorry for myself, I'm out of here. And on that uh, very subject, before um, I start, 37 years ago, this month, I met a lady called Linda, who has been my rock ever since, right to this day. She's the one that organized this event. And I stand on the stage and do the words, but she makes it possible by working her socks off day after day, week after week. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the fantastic work that she's done and the contribution she's made to my life, never mind to the work that we're trying to do. So thank you to Linda. Now, free your mind. I can't hear you, so there you go. I, I, free your mind is what the whole theme of this event is about. And, well, free our minds, because it includes mine as well. And free your mind doesn't mean believe what I say, or believe it because I say it, or take it as read. Free your mind just means opening the mind to all possibility, and then deciding what part of all possibility we choose to accept as reality. So what I'm not doing is standing up here today and saying, I've got all the answers, here you go, uh, is another belief system. It's information, it's what I've compiled, it's conclusions I've come to over the last 20 years of full-time research in about 45 countries, but it's information. It's not there to be believed just because I say it. And uh, I think I can uh, sum it up really by what this man said. Wilhelm Reich, who uh, was a philosopher and an uh, uh, inventor and what have you, and he said this, am I a spaceman? Do I belong to a new race on earth bred by men from outer space in embraces with earth women? I request my right and privilege to have such thoughts and ask such questions without being threatened to be jailed by any administrative agency of society. In the face of a rigid doctrinaire, self-appointed, ready-to-kill hierarchy of scientific censorship, it appears foolish to publish such thoughts. Anyone malignant enough could do anything with them, and they did. Still, the right to be wrong has to be maintained. We should not fear to enter a forest because there are wildcats around in the trees. We should not yield our right to well-controlled speculation. It is certain questions entailed in such speculation which administrators of established knowledge fear. But in entering the cosmic age, we should certainly insist on the right to ask new, even silly questions, or apparently so, without being molested. Twenty years ago, nearly, I decided I was going to take that right. And I'm going to continue to exercise that right to the day I leave this reality. Because if we don't, defend or express our right to go into these areas that are beyond the norm, then we put ourselves in the prisons, the mind prisons and therefore the physical prisons that those norms impose upon us. I would say this as well. This event today is not about demanding the right from authority to give us our freedom. My freedom 
all freedom is our natural and eternal right, not the gift of some dark suit or uniform to decide if it's going to give it to us or not. And so this is also not a day for being intimidated and frightened by this big brother crap and all these goons in uniform who seek to impose someone else's will upon us. It's just about exposing the way they're seeking to enslave us so we can see the game and therefore not play it. In fact, my uh, attitude to Big Brother can be summed up thus. <laughs> oh, Big Brother, Big Brother, oh my God! God, sod that for a lark. As Gandhi said, an error does not become truth by reason of multiplied propagation, nor does truth become error because nobody will see it. Put more simply in his words again, even if you are in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. And throughout history we have seen small minorities of people who have pointed out flaws in the norm of belief, or at least questioned it, who've turned out to be so right that now with hindsight we go, how could anyone ever believe the earth was flat? Or that if you went far enough you would go off the edge. But people did and it was the norm of the time. And we have norms now that are just as blatantly stupid with not even the benefit of hindsight the benefit of what we know now. This is today's flat earth. The fact that we live in the cutting edge of human evolution. The cutting edge of uh, how far humanity has come. Turning a planet of enormous beauty into a shite hole ain't the cutting edge of human evolution. We're also being asked to believe, as Orwell said, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. And we are the cutting edge of human understanding. As Michael Elner said, just look at us. Everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. Doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the major media destroys information, and religions destroy spirituality. I think there's more to know here. And it's all true. As H.L. Mencken said, the men the American people admire most extravagantly are the greatest liars. The men they detest most violently are those who try to tell them the truth. We live in topsy-turvy land. Why is everything upside down, everything back to front? Why are there billions of bewildered people who don't understand who they are, where they are, what the whole business of life is all about. The world seems such a, a ball of confusion and complexity and bewilderment, but it is when you don't have the coordinates to connect things together. Because when you connect the dots, you start to see that apparent complexity as it's played out, and apparent bewilderment as it's played out, 
has a very seriously uh, clear picture that emerges. Because as you connect the dots between different people, organizations, places, religions, history, suddenly the picture starts to form. Oh, so that's it. If you don't connect the dots, it's just a mass of what's all this about. When you connect the dots, you get the elephant in the living room. You can start to see daily life and the daily news that passes for it and all this stuff in a completely different light. And suddenly, what seemed to be incomprehensible starts to make clearer and clearer sense. And that picture, as the, debts, uh, the dots are connected, the debts too, it's all part of it, is that there are two prime realities that we are experiencing. We're experiencing the movie. That's the, the movie version of reality that we're given by the mainstream media, by what passes for education and all the other sources of mainstream information, which explain away events in the world in a certain way. But behind that, it becomes clearer as the dots join up that there is another agenda behind that, which the movie is simply there as a cover story to obscure and hide. And the foundation of that cover story, that, or the foundation of that secret agenda, is to get billions of people on this planet to wear a mask and play out a false identity that they don't even know is false. You know, we can, we can talk about banking scams and political scams and secret societies, and we should and we will later on as we go through this, but what those involved in the research of all this whole conspiracy stuff, I feel, need to appreciate is if that's as far as you go and no further, then you too are playing a kind of movie because you are looking at how it's playing out instead of the real foundation from which this whole conspiracy is based. And that is manipulating people to believe they're something they are not and to forget what they really are. And what we really are is consciousness. Infinite consciousness connected to all other consciousness, the seamless ocean of infinity. And we can move our point of observation around that consciousness and express and celebrate its uniqueness, but we are all of one infinite mind, one infinite consciousness. And the illusion of a partness is an experience of this reality and its extensuation or accentuation by the manipulators is to get us to see ourselves and everything in terms of a partners instead of as a connected whole. This is symbolically, even more than symbolically, the situation that this whole conspiracy is designed to put us in, in a bubble of consciousness, which I call body consciousness, which is disconnected from its awareness of the full magnitude of what it is to the point where it operates on a fraction of its true self and its infinite potential. So in that sense, you can get all that has been, is, and ever will be reading the frickin' sun and believing the date. That's what, how deeply disconnected we can uh, get. For people uh, watching this in other parts of the world, the sun is a newspaper, um, and I use that word in its widest possible sense.
You know, my, my brother said to me years ago, he said, you know, Dave, what's it all about? He said, you're born. He said, and, th and then you'd kind of get older and then you'd die. I mean, what's it all about? I mean, what is it all about? We're born into this world. We go through these kind of uh, situations of going older and doing this and doing that and doing the other. And, th and then we, we, we get older and, 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 and loads of people uh, in the world, vast numbers of people, it's a struggle and it's an effort and it's a daily grind and am I going to survive another day? And then at the top there, oh, you know, what will God think of me? You know, I mean, it's, it's a great line, isn't it? Hey, you mentioned some, some travel agent on some other dimension. Hey, ah, great, great, great vacation holiday, mate. What you do is you go into this dimension, you're born, you struggle all the way through it, lots of emotional upheaval. Um, then um, you get older and your body starts to break down. And then some guy on a cloud decides if you're going to go and sit next to him or if you're going to go to hell and stoke the fires forever. I mean, you think, yeah, I'll have two tickets, wouldn't you? What's it all about? I mean, I, there's got to be something else. If there isn't, I'm out of here and I'm staying. So, we are struggling to um, understand the world because we don't have the coordinates, which I'll come to. And it's, it, it's uh, obviously a world with some major, major problems in terms of its uh, operation and the way it's run. Doctors destroy health. Doctors destroy health because health is not about health, it is about wealth. It's the transnational drug corporations <laughs> controlling the medical system, so the scalpel and the drug is the only uh, response overwhelmingly to uh, human disease. And you know, some of the side effects of these drugs, if you've ever been to America and listened to the drug adverts, the drug adverts is one after another in America. They, they pay for American television, these things. And because of the law there, they tell you what the drug does, or supposed to, and then they have to reel off all the side effects. But they're not side effects, you see. That's another little con. Oh, these are the side effects of this drug. No, they're the effects, mate. Not side effects, the frickin' effects. <laughs> and I was watching one. This is a true story. Uh, uh, last year, I was watching one, and it was for um, a form of Viagra, right? And it said, um, it told you what it was going to do, uh, treat erectile dysfunction or bloody something. And then he starts reeling off breathlessly, trying to keep the money down, all these side effects. And this is not kidding you. He said at the end, and if you have an erection for more than four hours, consult your doctor immediately. <laughs> said it. And I'm sitting there watching the telly and I'm thinking, what's he going to do? I mean, excuse me, doctor, I've got this problem. What do you want me to do? The world's mad. God, I tell you what, if I had an erection for four hours, I wouldn't consult a doctor. I'd thank bloody God, me. <laughs> Three hours, 55 minutes, bigger than my bloody record already, I'll tell you. <laughs> So Big Pharma runs the health industry, and it's not about health, and that's why doctors destroy knowledge. Lawyer, doctors destroy health. Lawyers destroy justice. Of course they do, especially those that represent the state. And I love this one. When, you, when, the, when the state um, takes you to law, the people taking you to law have their legal bills paid by the people. The people who are being taken to law have to pay their own as well as the others. And then when uh, someone wants to take the government on for something the government's done, the government defends itself with the money uh, through the lawyers paid for by the people, and the person taking the government on has to pay their own as well as that. Universities destroy knowledge, of course. The one thing you don't want, if you want to create a centralized dictatorship 
is a thinking, sharp-minded, open-minded, aware population that can see through your crap. So you sell them from cradle to grave the belief system you want. You just program their minds to see the world the way that suits your agenda. All over the world, we must have education. Yes, let's try it. Let's have some education instead of indoctrination of a belief system. <laughs> governments destroy freedom. Of course they do. I mean, governments are not there. Let's get this, let's get this sorted out. Governments are not there to serve the people. The people are there to serve the government and the forces that control the government. That's the relationship, and we need to understand that. You've got the dark suits who um, orchestrate front up this political agenda for the Orwellian state. From, and they come from certain bloodlines, which I'll come to. Um, and these people are such front men, you can have an idiot. You can have an idiot in power as President of the United States. It doesn't matter because he ain't calling the shots. He's just signing the uh, legislation into law. So much so that when he's doing press conferences, he's got this wire in his bloody ear telling him what to bloody say if he gets in trouble, which is most of the time. <laughs> and this world is at the cutting edge of evolution. Mr. President, okay, that's good. Okay, now what we're going to do, Mr. President, we're going to have the big finish, the big Churchillian finish. Okay, go. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. <laughs> uh, uh, did, you, did you get that, did you get that Mr. President? <laughs> True quote. And now we have the um, choice between three people who are all controlled by the same force. It's called democracy. Which front man or woman do you want? There you go, cross there. And these are the people who are fronting up the destruction of our freedom, freedom of expression. Then the media. The media are there to tell the people the version of life and events that suits the agenda. And those real journalists who don't will tell you how hard it is to get other kinds of information into the mainstream. And the worst kind of censorship is self-censorship, where you know it ain't worth crossing that line because A, you'll get yourself in trouble, and B, it won't get in the paper or on the news, so you edit yourself. That's going on all the time. Religions destroy spirituality. Get into this um, in the second um, half. All the religions come from basically the same source and they're worshipping the same gods, the same gods that the secret societies worship. And what my father used to call bricks and mortar religion is there to enslave the minds of the people and divide and rule the people, not to open people to the true infinite magnitude of who they are. You can't say that! Pope will go mad! Couldn't give a shit, mate. It's a mad, 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 mad world which is sold to us as sanity and rational. And it's held together by what my friend Mike Lambert, who's in the audience today, calls repeaters. People just repeat facts because they've heard them from something, uh, someone else and then it becomes conventional wisdom, conventional knowledge. And everyone believes it. As uh, Oscar Wilde said, most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions, their lives are mimicry, their passions are quotation. And Mark Twain, I love this one, in religion and politics, people's beliefs and convictions are in almost every case gotten at second hand, without examination from authorities who have not themselves examined the questions at issue, but have taken them at second hand from other non-examiners whose opinions about them were not worth a brass farthing. There you have where the conventional knowledge, wisdom, this is our ismate, comes from. It's a war on the human mind and human perception 
So we see the world and ourselves in ways that allow this conspiracy to go on. And also, society is structured to keep us busy, 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 moving, moving, moving. Oh, mortgage. Oh, my God, rent. Oh, my God, job. Oh, my God, what's happening? Oh, it's a credit crunch. Oh, my God, food prices. So no one goes, ah, oh, so that's what's going on because you're too busy uh, trying to survive. That's the idea. And it starts with the kids now, younger and younger. Oh, you've got to pass this exam. You've got to pass this exam. Oh, my God, what will happen? Oh, you've got to get good grades. Oh, my God. Hey, have, have some bloody fun. Have a bloody laugh, mate. We should have happy lessons. What makes you happy? Okay, we're going to do that today. What makes you fulfilled? What makes you feel good about yourself? We're going to do that today. No, algebra. Algebra, what the bloody hell is all that about? <laughs> I could never work it out. I never tried, really. What does X equal? Couldn't give a shit, mate. <laughs> Whatever you say, ain't bothered. I've lived 56 years, right? I've never used bloody algebra. I've never, never entered my mind. Get yeah, that one, delete file. So we have this world of apparent confusion because of the way that it operates. We turn out shite that we don't know what to do with. We, we reach a, a, a level where we can create amazing technology and we use that technology to um, pepper bomb cities full of civilians. And you know, we've at the cutting edge of evolution, we can kill more people in one goal than ever before. Hey! Isn't it great to be human? And this is what we do in the name of freedom. We think it's okay for children to sign their names on bombs which end up on children just like them in the Lebanon. But we don't want to talk about that. Hey, here's a game show. Watch this. Shut up. Hey, honey, quick. It, she's going for the car. <laughs> Quicker the bloody better, I say. People around the world get bigger while people die because they've got enough, enough to eat. Massive amounts of food available, thrown away, while others, I, I, I've seen this live once, it's unbelievable, People living off rubbish tips to survive. But we don't want to talk about this. Oh, no. Hey, hey, quick, honey. There's a, there's a picture of Paris Hilton naked in the back of a car. Quick. Was that the car that lady just went for? Watch this. Shut up. Don't let's talk about this and get all moral about it. Let's talk about Janet Jackson's breast at the Super Bowl. Hey, the moral fiber of America is collapsing. Oh, no, 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 that's the moral. This is, this, this is fighting for peace. This is just collateral damage. Don't worry about it. As Gandhi said, what difference does it make to the dead, to the orphans and the homeless, whether the mad destruction is wrought under the name of totalitarianism or the holy name of liberty or democracy? None whatsoever. They're all tyrannies when they do that. Then we have the money. What you do is you go to the bank and you borrow money that has never, does not, and will never exist, called credit, and then you, you mortgage your house to it, you mortgage your car to it, your land to it, your business to it, and if you don't pay back money that doesn't exist, called credit, then the people that have lent you that non-existent money get your car and your business and your house. Yes, that makes sense. And this money scam where they get us into debt by borrowing money that has never, does not, will never exist is in the very DNA of society. It controls choice, controls maneuverability, or if we allow it to, controls society. And who controls money controls society. Who controls money? A tiny few people, as we'll see. But we don't want to talk about that. Hey, honey, quick, on the Jerry Springer show, this man's going to hit his girlfriend. Quick, quick. Watch this. Shut up. Then there's the new religion of celebrityism. 
Go to the supermarket. Yay. Get on with your life. There's the goddess. And then, if you want to know what's going on in the world, I mean, that's no problem, because these pe people will tell you everything that the people that control and own their industry um, think is fit for you to know, so you'll believe and see the world the way they want you to see it. It's called the news. And then be afraid. It's a world in which we must, we must be afraid all the time. We must be afraid of not having enough money, afraid of what's going to happen um, uh, in all areas of our lives, afraid of the future, afraid, survive, we must survive, or oh, we must always be in a state of fearing not surviving. It's a crazy, crazy world. But why? Why is it an upside down, lunatic world that we live in? People might say, oh, it's, it's all, uh, it's all a uh, coincidence just happened like that. Well, I would say after 20 years of this, that it is coldly calculated to be like this because of the outcome that it gives those who are manipulating society in this way. And it's not just one level. There are multi-levels to this conspiracy. Yes, there's dark suits sitting around the table and, uh, and, and orchestrating this to an extent, but there's still the gophers playing it out. It goes much, much deeper and we'll go there as we go along today. The reason we are confused about the world and everything that goes on in it is because we don't have the coordinates. We don't have the coordinates from which to uh, see how things fit together. I remember I was on the Isle of Wight ferry once, and what it does, it comes out of Portsmouth Harbour, it goes along the coast a little bit, and then it turns out and goes across to the Isle of Wight. Well, it was so foggy on this day that you couldn't see the land here, as you normally could. So you're going along, and you just see fog. And after a while, it seemed to me and others that it was just going straight. And I thought, this sodding thing is going to France. What's going on? And I said to one of the crew, what's happening? This is, this is not going the right way, is it? And the next thing you know, the Isle of Wight Pier appeared in front of us. It had actually gone absolutely the right way. But because I didn't have the coordinate in which to make that, uh, sense of that, I was completely lost in the direction I was going. That was so symbolic of the way it works. So I'm going to go through a lot of coordinates today. Because when the coordinates are put into place, then what happens becomes, or what is happening becomes totally blatant as the dots connect. It's a duck. You're a journalist, aren't you? Yes. How did I guess? <laughs> Coordinate number one. Who are we? How few people kind of seem to ask that question, in my experience anyway. We, you know, I live in the real world, mate. I've got to get on with my job and my life. Yeah, but who are we? What are we doing? Oh, I'm bothered. We've got to get on with our life. But without this knowledge this key coordinate, how the hell can we understand what's happening in our part in it? Coordinate number one, we are consciousness. We are not the body we think we are. And the idea is to put us in these eggshells of consciousness, and it's a doddle, a doddle, if we don't hold on to an understanding or have an understanding of who we really are and the magnitude of it. A quote from one of my books, only when we know who we are can we know freedom, of course. How, unless we know the nature of reality and who we are and our part in it, how can we understand the world if we don't understand the reality that is the world? No wonder we're bloody confused. What is reality? How about that question? Oh, no, that's just for scientists. It's not for you. We'll watch the football. Nazi propaganda minister, Goebbels. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the truth becomes the greatest enemy of the state. And the truth that is most suppressed, the biggest lie of all of them, on which all the others are based, is it's all an illusion. This physical world is not physical, it's not even out there, it's in here. It's a holographic projection. So I'll 
come to as we go along. It's an illusion of physicality, an illusion of solidity. We are consciousness. And it's so easy to trick the mind-brain to see reality in ways that are not actually what it's looking at. And this is this amazing bloke who draws um, pictures on flat pavements, and yet the mind reads them, the brain reads them as three-dimensional. Does some great stuff. Uh, there's another one. Uh, we, uh, we can look at that as, what, seven compartments, or we can see that as a box. Depends on how the brain reads it. These um, color reds are both the same, but because of their interaction and placement with other colors, they look totally different because the brain reads them differently. We are decoding reality, and how we decode it decides the reality we experience. Major, major point we need to understand. Einstein, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. Why it's a persistent one we'll come to before we finish this first section. But reality is an illusion and we need to understand that. We think that we are physical bodies and that's who we are. I'm Ethel Jones, Charlie Smith, I'm a taxi driver, I'm a doctor, whatever. No, no! They are what we are experiencing. They're not who we are. There are many multiple levels to us. This is just one that allows us to experience this reality. If I want to pick that up, uh, my consciousness could not pick that up because it's vibrating too quickly. It's not in sync in the uh, frequency range of that, so I couldn't do it. I take on this outer shell that operates within the frequency range that I want to experience. Now I can interact with it. Simple as that. We are consciousness working through a physical body. All life is consciousness uh, and energy animating a holographic forms, including plants, everything. We are consciousness. I was in the bath the other day, uh, playing with me duck or something, and I got this picture in my mind, real clear, and my great friend Neil Haig, uh, a brilliant artist, and any time you see a picture with this style throughout this next seven hours, it's from Neil. He's out the front there if you want to talk to him. And, and he painted this for me when I told him what I, what, I, what I saw. And basically it's this. It was, this is consciousness, symbolically, that infinite uh, consciousness that we are. And I saw an eye appear in the, uh, in the consciousness there, and out of it came this telescope. And uh, it was looking into this world that we're experiencing. And as um, the telescope appeared, so it morphed into a human body. And that's what the body is. It's a telescope that allows consciousness to experience this reality, this reality of apparent division, um, and have the experience of that. But we've got trapped in the belief that that is the totality of who we are. Consciousness and the body interact during an experience here, but the body is not who we are. It's interesting, this um, energy field we call the aura, whatever, you have energy coming down through the top of the head and out and going the other way, uh, and it's like an electrical... Um, burst of energy going through the body which throws out this electromagnetic field that we call the aura. And interestingly, when you do the same with electric wire, you put a uh, current through the wire, it throws out an electromagnetic field. And in the same way that this happens to us, so it happens to the earth. Because everything is a reflection of everything else and works in basically the same way. And this combination of the genetics of the body and the electromagnetic field I call body consciousness. And we have a choice 
of connecting that body consciousness level of our experience to the great infinite all that is, in which case we will have access to a massively expanded level of awareness and perception and be able to see through what we can't see when we're stuck in the body reality or, and that's what this is basically, this eggshell I talk about, it is the body consciousness, the auric field working directly through the body. And if we get isolated in that, then our level of re reality, perception, and what we can perceive and expand our mind to understand is massively uh, suppressed. And this is the situation that we face in this world. People who are infinite consciousness operating at the level of body consciousness. And that's exactly where the manipulators want us. Because if we are not connecting out there and getting our insight, inspiration, intuitive knowing from out there, then where do we look to to get a fix on who we are and what's happening in the world? We look that way, through the ears and the eyes. And who's controlling that information? Those that control the media, education, etc. Gotcha. The body, I call it, I call it a genetic spacesuit, and it's kind of funny, you know, if you were, if you were on the moon with someone, and 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 and, and, and the, uh, an astronaut started thinking he was his spacesuit, I mean, crikey, can you imagine? Hey, Houston, Houston, we got a problem. Bill thinks he's his spacesuit. He's bloody mad because he's not his spacesuit. Yeah, but we think we're our spacesuit. And what would there be in that situation on the moon? There would be chaos. Well, that's why there's chaos here, because we believe we're our spacesuit. That's what makes racism so insane. It's like saying, oh, I'm better than you because my spacesuit's a different colour. Bloody ridiculous. But the cutting edge of human knowledge, so why should, I, why should I complain? We are consciousness working through the body. Now, I've got a real, I've got a real um, uh, um, amazing feeling for this. About two years ago, just before I last spoke here, when my mother died, Barbara, and I went along to uh, the funeral, obviously, and my, my brother had organized it, and he said to me, do you want to come and see, you want to come and see uh, your mum while uh, in the uh, mortuary um, or at the funeral parlor? And I, my immediate reaction was, no, no, I'll remember where she was, because it's just a body anyway. But something said, no, go, 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 go. And for some reason in my life, I've never come across, the first time I've seen a, a dead body was my mother. And uh, I turn up, and I walk in this room, and there's this body in this coffin, this open coffin. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but it was dead. There was no bloody life there whatsoever. Dead, unbelievably dead, took me aback dead. And next to it was this picture which my brother had had blown up, which was going to go and be used in the funeral, which it was. And there was my mother's absolutely dead body, and there was this picture of my mother absolutely full of life, full of energy, full of sparkle. And I stood there, and I could see in those two images what life is, what consciousness is, because that was alive, that was dead. We are consciousness, and we've got confused. And in identifying who they are, we are with the body, we've seri seriously buggered up our sense of perception and therefore our ability to be free. Um, the um, energy that we, or the reality that we are experiencing, that we s apparently see with our eyes, is just a frequency range. That's all it is, and it is minute what we call visible light. According to current mainstream science, the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005% of the energy known to exist in the universe. 0.005%. And visible light, which is the only frequency that our eyes can uh, decode into this reality, 
is a fraction of the 0.005%. We are basically visually blind in terms of what exists in the same space that we're experiencing. It's just a television, uh, holographic television station we're experiencing. Tiny frequency range, visible light that we are experiencing. And what we are is, at this level, receiver transmitters of information. And the range of frequencies that we are accessing decides the range and perception and awareness of reality that we experience. So the more you can close down the range of frequencies that we are accessing, the more you close down the perception and the sense of infinity of the people you are targeting. The body is a biological computer. Biological in the sense that, it, unlike a uh, desktop computer, it has the ability to an extent to think for itself and work things out for itself. That's what we call evolution on a physical level. The computer is constantly receiving information, vibrational information from its environment, and it is reacting to that. It does it all the time. If we go into a place where it's cold, it will react to that. Where it's hot, it will react to that. And it's the same with things like um, um, animals, that over a period of time, their environment changes. That information is being received by the computer and analyzed by the computer, and it's making changes. And if those environmental changes, habitat changes, happen slow enough, that is why you see animal bodies evolve to fit the new environment, but if it happens really quick, we call it extinction because it can't change fast enough. It's a computer working. And we are receiving vibrational information which we're decoding into this reality. Get into that more shortly. We are interacting with this infinite uh, consciousness, but how much of that consciousness are we reacting to uh, with? That depends on the range of frequencies we're accessing. And we're a bit like a, a dodgem car in a fairground. You know, you've got the dodgem car, it's going round, it's doing everything, lots of energy, and then once the power is switched off, it's, hey, my car's gone dead. Yes, because its energy source is gone, and that's what we call death. It's not death at all. It's the movement of consciousness out of this reality. That's all. What we call near-death experiences have enormous amounts of common stories about what they experienced when they left the body and then were returned when their body was revived. Stories that support massively what I'm uh, saying here today about the fact that we are consciousness and the body is just a vehicle. They talk about going through the tunnel um, into another reality and how uh, limitation disappears, how the emotional uh, intensity disappears, because a lot of that emotional intensity, if not all of it, is body consciousness. This is what one near-death experiencer said about what he experienced when he left the body. Everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. That is who we are, and we need to remember it so we can sort this place out. What do you mean there's no time? That's stupid. All oh, right. So, uh, manufactured time is on my wrist. If I, if I cross a certain invisible point in the world, I enter yesterday or tomorrow. Ridiculous. It's a decoding illusion, time and sequence. As William Blake said, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Everything is everything else. 
happening at the same time. It's a decoding process. If you are, um, if you are watching a, 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 a film, movie, on uh, a, a DVD, on the telly, where you are in the movie, you think is the present. The scenes in the movie you've just left or watched is your past and the scenes you've not seen yet are your future. But all of them still exist in the same moment that you're experiencing what you perceive to be the present. And if you run back, bingo, you're in the past, you run forward, you're in the future. No, you're in the same now. As H. Uh, M. Tomlinson said, we see things not as they are, but as we are, because as we are decides how we decode reality. And this conspiracy might play out as banking scams and political scams. Yes, it does, and we should know that. But this conspiracy is about manipulating our sense of who we are so we decode what they want us to experience. And what that uh, perception is one of division, a partners, because that creates the fault lines through which they can divide and rule us when we are oneness, all connected. At different points of perception and observation within that whole, therefore expressing glorious diversity, but still connected. And that's the point, you know, I understand it. When you're talking about oneness, people think that it's like everyone therefore becomes one clone blob, like this. Oh, I'm oneness, oh, I'm oneness and all, so am I, oh yeah. What is oneness? What is this oneness I'm talking about? It is all possibility. That's what it is. It is everything that has, is, or ever will be there to be experienced. So there is no contradiction between being in a point of awareness of the connectedness of everything and at the same time celebrating and expressing your glorious diversity and uniqueness of perception. Indeed, the uniqueness of our uh, expressing of our lives is uh, honoring, if you like, the oneness that is all because it's all possibility. What you get, ironically, when you, um, when you disconnect from that into that, is you get a situation where um, you do get people who are, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not oneness, neither am I, I'm not oneness. You do get uniformity, because people start operating on the same tiny range of frequencies, and therefore they, they start acting and seeing the world the same. Everyone thinks the same, everyone's tuning to the same bloody station. That's why we think when we experience uh, the world, and understandably it seems like that, and the way we decode it, that the world is out there, that, that the summit's out there. In fact, it's just a projection. It's all going on in our minds, in our heads, as we decode reality. As uh, the great uh, Bill Hicks, the American comedian, said, what a great man he was. Great man. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream. And we are the imagination of ourselves. And that's the, the, the foundation of the conspiracy. Manipulating our imagination of ourselves. Infinite love is the only truth. The existence of an infinite consciousness is the only truth. Everything else is illusion. Everything else is the imagination of that consciousness made manifest and experienced. This is who we are. This is what we think we are. We think we're the body that we see in the mirror. Humans are a software program. It's like playing on the computer a certain piece of software. We call it genetic inheritance and all that stuff. And from that we get what we call personality. We get all the other genetic traits and we think they're who we are. It's a software program. Cultures, 
this different cultures, they're software programs. Nothing wrong with them. Love them, experience them. Illusions only control you when you think they're real. When you, th when you know they're illusions, play with them, have a laugh. But they're, they're software programs. We're not human. That's our experience. It's not who we are. Even my body's the same. <laughs> Even mine. Lost a bit of weight, you know. <laughs> Been off the booze for three months, that's why. This is an article in the San Francisco Chronicle. DNA is a universal software code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. Even the cutting edge of mainstream science is now beginning to turn its mind to the fact that this is computer and this may well be a illusory, almost computer game. If you look at the codes that make up DNA, A, C, G, and T, or in my case, G, and T, G, and T, G, and T. Oh, get, no, give it up, give it up. I gave it up three months ago, sorry. These four codes, depending on where they are in relationship to each other, decide so many things. They decide if, if your body's a mouse or if it's a human. And the difference in the coding uh, compared with the difference in how it expresses itself in, in the different physical form is minimal. And if you look at those codes in the uh, Matrix movies, very, very similar, because the principle of that movie is correct. On one level, we are a digital, energetic construct operating beyond human sight. And the reason now they're talking about what they call human computer interface, where they can get the computer to be worked by the brain without any movement of the hands is very, very simple. They're connecting two computers. One immensely, staggeringly more advanced than the other, but still the basically same principle. What they don't tell us is that's how it is. When you look at the human body from a point of view of a computer, it ticks almost every box. Well, it does tick every box I've come across so far. When um, the computer has a virus and it gets out of control and eventually it won't switch on, what do we say? My computer's dead. Why? Because it cannot connect to its energy source. What do we say when people die? We say the body's dead. The computer's dead. The energy source has left. That's why. We talk about putting um, computers into sleep mode where they just tick over and... and, and, and uh, slow down and shut down to a very large extent. So do we. Then we've got Norton antivirus and all these other antivirus technologies. And what do they do? They are programmed to um, attack viruses and threats to the body, to the um, PC computer, desktop computer's um, functional system. We've got a Norton antivirus. We call it the human immune system does the same basic principle because it's a computer. This is a picture, uh, an enhanced version of a picture taken at the Necker Hospital in a research pro process in um, Paris. And this is a, a motherboard. That is the motherboard of the body computer. And that's the system, the meridian system, the circuit board that acupuncture and other alternative forms of healing work on. Why? Because this qi energy, as the Chinese call it, going around the body and these lines, is information passing around the computer, just like information passes around the desktop computer. And they found in their experiments that when this energy is moving too slowly compared to optimum, the body starts to show signs of dis-ease and disharmony. Why? Because the information going around the body and being processed is being processed too slowly for optimum health. What do we say when we've got a virus in our computer on the desk? My computer's bloody slow today. Same thing. And the acupuncture needles and other forms of Chinese uh, acupuncture healing are there to... Um, reharmonize the flow of this energy so the information's passing around to optimum and we become well again. 
Then you've got the brain. The so-called brain of the computer, as they call it, is the central processing unit, the CPU. The brain of the body is the CPU of the body computer. It's the, the main processor of information, receiving and um, sending out. And it's decoding information all the time and therefore creating our reality. The DNA and the genetic structure is like the hard drive. And the hard drive is passed on through what we call procreation, which is like on a computer level, two hard drives fusing to create another hard drive, which is a uh, combination of the two. And together, the genetic structure and the auric field make up body consciousness, which has an awareness of its own and can function in this world pretty well even without connection to out there. Pretty well, I mean it can survive. But it's a manipulator's bloody dream. All these uh, things we call cultures and races and people and personalities, they're software programs. This is a guy called um, William Sheridan. He was in a New York hospital waiting for a heart transplant and he went on an art therapy course and he's meeting the mother of the person who donated his heart there. This was his art um, when he went on the course. He then had the heart transplant and when he was recovering he went back on the art therapy course and started doing things that were much more sophisticated compared with the real basic stuff he was capable of before. He had no idea where it was coming from. The art therapist had no idea where it was coming from. And he asked because he, through various means, he managed to talk to the uh, mother of the donor. He um, asked her if her son uh, liked art at all. And it turns out her son was crazy about art from a very early age. He wanted art materials rather than toys from the age of about 18 months. And doctors who have studied this connection between attributes appearing out of nowhere and personality changes in the recipient mirroring the personality of the donor, that, 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 that research is now uh, pretty extensive. People like um, the lady who had um, uh, lungs transplanted, who was frightened of heights, and then started climbing mountains. She didn't know for a long time when she was doing this, but the lungs came from an avid mountain climber. And it's kind of, oh, this is strange. How can this be strange? How can this, be, how can this happen? It's because it's a computer download. The recipient organs and the energy field that goes with it are downloaded into the recipient's computer and then become available to affect the personality and to, to affect the abilities and attributes of the receiver. My great friend Crater Mutwa in Africa, the Zulu shaman, he told me, uh, when I, I called him, I talked to him about this some years ago, and he said, oh yes, he said, in um, Africa when they used to eat people, he said it was a, it was a golden law that um, the people ha who they were eating had to be boiled uh, to a certain uh, temperature um, and for a certain time because the um, legend was that if you ate them without that being done, then they, you became them. You took on their personality. Now one of the great ways that we identify with being this is I'm a man or I'm a woman. And nothing wrong with that, it's an experience. They're very different experiences. Great, fabulous, it's an illusion, enjoy it. But we get caught in the illusion that they're who we are. Suddenly we are in a, a place where we can get uh, manipulated and uh, diverted. Now, how can who we are be a man and a woman when the nature of that can be changed by chemical change? This is, oh, this is not, but it's a, it's a, a chicken indicating uh, the story I'm going to tell. Freaky the chicken, you might have heard that story a few years ago. Freaky the chicken started out life as a hen, laying eggs, all that stuff, and then suddenly, because something happened in the chicken's body to create massive amounts of testosterone, um, it grew a comb, it started crowing at dawn and chasing the hens. Why? Because it had moved from being a woman, female, to a male purely by a chemical change. 
because it's the computer changing, not us. I got this from BBC News recently. Scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. Researchers genetically modified the insect so that a group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song, behavior usually only seen in males. Why? Because it's a computer program, it's software. Sometimes I get up um, early in the morning, in the winter, um, before dawn, and I sit there in the office working um, on the website and stuff, and then the sun starts to come up and the bird song starts. And I'm thinking, you know, is there like a, a conductor with a stick waiting for dawn? I'm going, Phew! no, they just start singing. Just like Freaky started crowing at dawn when the testosterone came in. Because it's a body computer program, a software program. Then we talk about personalities and emotions. It's no accident, I would suggest, that so many, enormous numbers of uh, near-death experiences tell the same story, that when they've, le when they've left the body in that period, they don't feel emotion like they feel it here. They're not cold, but they don't feel that intensity of emotion that we feel. Why? Because that's a body consciousness. Um, software program. This is why psychiatrists and people, they say, some of them, they can break down human personalities into about 12 archetypes and combinations of them. You can't do that with infinite possibility, but you can do it with computer programs. We had that lady in Britain a few years ago who um, had been in um, institutions, in and out of them, with real manic, deep depression for 40 years. And her personality, people say, oh, she's a manic depressive. That's who she is. That's her. 40 years later, someone said, what happened about the time this started? Can you think? Did you do anything? And she said, the only thing I can think of is that um, I, I had something like 19 tooth fillings, mercury. It was pointed out that maybe that could be a connection. She had all the mercury teeth fillings taken out, went on a mercury detox. After 40 years, manic depression, gone. Because it was a computer uh, level of operation that was manifesting it due to a chemical imbalance. We're not even our emotions most of the time. We are consciousness. And we've forgotten, and therefore these computer programs, these software programs, take us over and we think we, we're them. And so instead of driving the bus, we're sitting at the back thinking we can't drive it. The brain is two halves of the brain. There's uh, the right brain and there's the left brain, and they have very, very different roles to play, especially in personality. And between them is this uh, bridge called the corpus callosum which bridges the information, again, information between the two. Now, this is another a picture that uh, Neil Haig uh, did for me recently. Um, symbolically uh, looking at what the, the right brain and the left brain do. The right brain is out there. It's creativity. It's inspiration. It's the maverick. It's the connection to all that is. It's the greater awareness. Um, and the left brain is about structure. It, wants, it sees things in parts, not as wholes. It wants uh, things to be structured. It's about language, and it's about um, organization in a physical way. It's about being what we call, though often that's not what it is, rational thinking. And both sides of the brain are necessary. If you get a right brain person, we've all met them, they're fantastically creative, but they're out on another cloud. There's nothing going on down here. But you get a really imprisoned left brain person, they can't see the connections with anything. They're here. Boom, boom. I'll tell you a story. Sound like Max Bygraves. I'll tell you a story. Not many people reacted there. Who's Max Bygraves? Shows me bloody age. Yeah, he's just a bit older than me. Anyway, what's... Um, what happened was I was asked to speak at the Oxford Union, at Oxford University, right? Now, there are whole brain people at Oxford University. I'm not knocking it. But because of the nature of it, there's a hell of a lot of real left brain people at Oxford University. And I had this bizarre situation. When I, when I do something like this to open-minded people, 
I just give it. Ah, there you go. There, 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 there it is. Make of it what you will. But when you're talking to a real left brain audience, even at the elite Oxford University, where they've passed all these exams to get there, he's clever. I'm sitting um, in the hotel room before I'm going to do it, and I'm thinking, how do I put this in baby steps so they'll get it? Why? Because the left brain is what I was talking to there. And it doesn't get this wider picture. I'll come more to that in a second. Now, I want to give you an idea of this left brain thing. If you go to my website, davidike.com, and you go into the What is Reality Research Archive, you can see this 20-minute clip of this lady. Um, it was sent to me a few um, weeks ago, and it was like a eureka moment um, because of um, what she experienced. This is a lady called Jill Balty taylor who's a, um, a neuroanatomist, brain scientist for short, and um, she had a stroke which shut down her left brain, and instead of conking out, she spent hours experiencing what was happening while it was going on. And she talked about the fact that um, she got up, she, had, she was having this stroke, she didn't realize it immediately, and um, she got onto the exercise machine. This is how she describes what happened. So I got up and I jumped onto my exercise machine. And I'm uh, jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body and I thought, whoa, I'm a weird looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. I looked down at my arm and I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what's wrong with me? What's going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter went totally silent just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button and total silence. And at first I was shocked to find myself inside a silent mind, but then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. Then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online and says to me, hey, we've got a problem, we've got a problem, we've got to get some help. So it's like, okay, okay, I've got a problem. But then I immediately drifted back out into the consciousness and I affectionately uh, referred to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So I'm here in this space and any stress related to my job, it was gone. Again, stress, body consciousness. And I felt lighter in my body. And I imagine all of the relationships in the external world and the many stresses related to any of those, they were gone. I felt a sense of peacefulness. And imagine what it would be like to lose 37 years of emotional baggage. I felt euphoria. Euphoria was beautiful. And then my left hemisphere comes back online and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention, you've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help, I've got to focus. So I've got to get help, I've got to call work. I couldn't remember the number at work, so I remembered in my office I had a business card with my number on it. So I go to my business room, I pull out a three-inch stack of business cards. And I'm looking at the card on top, and even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if it, this was my card or not, because all I could see was pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And I would wait uh, for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not my card, that's not my card, that's not my card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch inside of that stack of cards. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers, I do not understand the telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right there, right here. I take the business card and I put it right here and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. 
Eventually the whole number gets dialed and I'm listening to the phone. And my colleague picks up the phone and he says to me, Woo! 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 And I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. <laughs> and so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know, that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. What's happening is the left brain, because of what's happening to it, has stopped decoding vibrational information into human language and vibrational information into this reality. Therefore, it sees pixels, which is the next level of reality to this one. When I awoke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Because I could not identify the position of my body in space, I felt enormous and expansive like a genie just liberated from a bottle. What a wonderful expression of what, it's, what it is. And my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through the sea of silent euphoria, nirvana. I found nirvana. I remember thinking there's no way I could ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But I realized, but I'm still alive, I'm still alive, and I found nirvana. And if I found nirvana and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana. And I picture a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time. And that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be and what an insight this could be in how to live our lives. And it motivated my recovery. So who are we? We are the life force of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in this world right here and now. I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere uh, where I, uh, we are. I am the life force power of the universe and the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular genuses that make up my form. At one with all that is, or I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, separate from you. I am Jill Bolte Taylor, intellectual neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which, would, which do you choose and when? I believe that the more time we spend choosing to run the deeper inner peace circuitry in our right hemispheres, the more peace we will project into the world and the more peaceful our planet will be. And I thought that was an idea worth sharing. Quite bloody right. And that is someone experiencing what I'm saying here, that we are decoders of information, and this is an illusion, it is a decoded uh, uh, holographic illusion. And this bridge, the corpus callosum, is a target for those that manipulate us big time. When we take uh, psychoactive drugs, I did it uh, twice, uh, about 2003, it's quite an experience, but I uh, don't feel the need to do it again. What is happening is it's affecting the way our brain-mind bodies decode reality. And it is opening up a wider range of frequencies. And um, we, that's why we experience extraordinary things. How can this be? This is not real. No, it's not real here, but it is real. And other times, um, you access frequencies that are so far out there, the left brain can't work it out. I call it bugger me time, you know. Bugger this, I can't work this out. And, and, and you, you get these kind of um, uh, amazing uh, concepts and, and energies and consciousness coming at you and the left brain's trying to work it out. Well, you've got, you've got, to, you've got to decode it into something, you know, and it's like, all right, it's a, it's a turquoise eagle eating a Big Mac. Okay, have the, I'll do that. And then you go, hey man, I had a incredible trip last night. I, I saw this big uh, turquoise eagle, he was eating a Big Mac, you know. No, no, that was bugger me time. It couldn't work it out, mate, what was going on. And this is the target. The left brain. The soldiers on the door. This is a key to understanding this conspiracy. The whole of society is structured 
to turn people into left-brain prisoners who experience reality through that version of perception. A partner's division. I am Charlie Smith. I must jump over everybody. To succeed, I must be a success. People must say you're successful. That's my identity. That's my sense of self. And so what they do, if you, I mean, look at the system. If you want to progress within the system, this left-brain society we live in, then you have to be very, very good at passing exams. You go to school, you pass exams. And what are you doing in exams? You're taking information, given to you, you're putting it in the left brain, you're holding it, you're regurgitating it out on an exam paper by telling the system what it's told you to believe. If you're very good at that, you go to university. If you're really good at that, you go to Oxford University or Cambridge or Yale or somewhere, unless you've got a few quid, in which case you go anyway like George Bush. Anyway, and then you choose your speciality. If you're very, very good at university, at passing exams, boom, 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 then you get great degrees and then you get your speciality and you go into uh, being a doctor or being a scientist and being a, uh, a, even a politician, all these people. And, all, and therefore, all these people that are in the positions of power within the institutions that control and dictate the reality and direction of society are all, by the time they get there, fully paid up prisoners of the left sodding brain. That's why scientists can't get it, most of the mainstream ones. Because they're so in here, how can they understand concepts of reality in here? They can't. That's rubbish. I can't see it, taste it, uh, hear it. Or, or, or feel it, so it can't exist. But it does, no, it can't exist. And I'm a scientist, I'm clever. <laughs> and so, if you look at society, you'll see more as the months go on, um, you are looking at a society designed to put pr the, 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 uh, the centuries across the entrance to that. So this doesn't talk to itself. And they don't become whole brain people. We become prisoners, and that prison is the prison of the left brain. That's what it is, essentially. René Descartes, the um, French uh, philosopher and mathematician, said this about uh, finding a way to express self-identity. I think, therefore, I am. I would take it a stage further, and I would say at the body consciousness level, I compute, therefore, I am. What we're being subjected to is mass hypnosis. Mass hypnosis, just like the stage hypnotist and the stooges on the stage, where the hypnotist puts into the stooge a programmed version of reality, a belief in reality. And then what happens is that belief edits reality to fit the belief. So suddenly they see an elephant in the audience, there's no elephant in the audience but there is in their reality. They taste a potato and uh, taste a, uh, eat a potato and taste an apple because although the uh, electrical signal of the taste of the potato has gone to the brain, the imposed belief, the program, recodes that um, signal into the taste of a Apple. The person is tasting an apple while eating a potato. Because it's all... This is what MSG does in food. They call it a flavor enhancer. What is it? It tricks the brain to decode more taste than is actually in the food. That's what it is. Um, and we're dealing with a mass version of hypnosis on the people of, of this world. Paul McKenna, uh, the, uh, he's a hypnotist and uh, uh, works with the mind of people, television shows and stuff like that. I watched, um, where you saw this, it used to be on the, uh, on the internet, I don't know if you can see it now, but it was from the Top Gear program on BBC. And if you haven't seen it, what happened was this guy, uh, Richard Hammond, he was put under um, hypnosis by uh, McKenna, and the first part of it was they were out um, filming at a racetrack. And of course, once you put into a trance, a programmed trance, a programmed reality, you lose the memory of being put into the programmed reality. That's how it works. Nothing's happened to you in your mind. So Hammond's um, just about to get in a car to drive McKenna around the track, and McKenna just went like that with his fingers, and, and, and Hammond went, boom, gone. And McKenna said to him, 
when I bring you back to a waking state or words to that effect, you're not going to be able to know anything about how to drive a car. He's come back, he has no idea that's happened. Sits in the car, got the key in his hand, doesn't know what to do with it. Completely, completely lost. Doesn't know the first thing about driving a car. So they come back to the studio live here, and um, they, uh, they have a laugh about it and everything, and Hammond thinks it's all over, but you know, McKenna's sitting there and everything, and then McKenna does the same thing in the studio. Hammond, hmm. And he tells him that this car, this toy car, is actually his real Porsche 911 Turbo or something, some flash bloody car. And he goes over and he gets into it, thinking this is his real car. That's what's going on in his mind as he decodes reality. And then um, Jeremy Clarkson drives this one into the side of this one. He reacts as if he's just uh, pranked his real car. Why? Because reality is being decoded in his mind. And to him it's real. And that's what's happening to us all the time. We're asleep. We're in a trance. And that's why it's so appropriate when people say, I'm waking up now. I can see it. As Voltaire said, so long as the people do not care to exercise their freedom, those who wish to tyrannize will do so. For tyrants are active and ardent and will devote themselves in the name of any number of gods, religious or otherwise, to put shackles upon sleeping men. And of course, first, you must have sleeping men and women, and that's what the whole deal has been about. You are getting sleepy, sleepy. Sleepy, sleepy. Good evening. Now tonight's news. <laughs> These people are hypnotists. They don't realize it. They're programming a reality by repetition of a version of reality that they pound out on their mainstream news all the time. We, are not, we see things not as they are, but as we are. The conspiracy in a line. The idea is to get us to think that we are the person we see reflected in the mirror. No, that's the vehicle we're using to experience this reality. This is who we are. Division is what they want. A sense of oneness is what they don't want. And oneness, not, not just between humans, but between everything. You know, the ancients talked about, um, and some people still talk about today, about going and experiencing the spirit of a mountain or something. And of course, the left brain scientists, you can't, you can't experience the spirit of a mountain, it's a pile of rock. Because that's what the left, brass, the left brain sees it. And yet, the mountain is just energy consciousness, and that's a holographic version of it that we see on the physical level. So you can interact with that, just as you can interact with plants. Um, this is um, uh, Virginia, Credo Mutwa's wife, and uh, she's got a, a herbal garden, and she talks to her plants. And she puts, she puts uh, little coins next to them in thanks when she's taken bits of, off them to, to use in herbal remedies and stuff. And of course, the left brain is to go, what's, what's the plant going to do with the money? Is it going to buy a beer? It's stupid, you know. <laughs> no, no, it's energy. It is a representation of energy. Oh, yeah, I get that. Oh, stupid. We are consciousness. We are energy. We are all one consciousness. So, where are we? Where are we? We are in our own minds, basically. We are in a, um, our own heads, symbolically. We are decoding reality in our own minds. It's not out there, it's in here. We are taking frequency fields and vibrational fields and we are, through the brain, turning them into a holographic reality that does not exist out there. It, holograms appear to exist in space, but they don't. Holograms you buy in the shops. This hologram doesn't uh, have space either. We are decoding it into a holographic television station within the frequency of visible light. We talk about seeing is believing, but it ain't. Believing is seeing, because what we believe affects what we decode and therefore what we see. There's that great line in a Matrix movie where um, the Neo character is saying to the Morpheus character, what is real? And Morpheus says, what's the effect of what is real? If, if you're talking about what we can see, touch, taste, um, hear, etc., then real is just electrical signals interpreted by your mind. That's absolutely what we're doing. Because the five senses decode vibrational frequencies 
and then send those signals to the brain, and it's the brain that decodes them into the reality we think we're experiencing. So hypnotists can manipulate reality in their various forms. The um, visual cortex areas of the brain do it um, in relationship to the eyes. What we think is out there actually exists, symbolically anyway, in our head. As the neurons fire in a certain uh, sequence, they create reality based on our belief. Now, if we've got open minds, we can be decoding vast, vast realities and be multidimensional in our perception and awareness. We can be in this world physically, but not of this world in terms of our por point of perception. Therefore, we're going to see the world in a completely different way to those stuck in left brain consciousness. Or we can get caught in the eggshells, in which case we are decoding a very small band of frequencies which makes us think we live in a world of limitation. We exist as an energy construct. These are the vortex points, the, the colors here, the, we call them chakras, wheels of light in the Sanskrit language. Um, the vortex points in the body. When, we de when this um, goes through the decoding process, it becomes the holographic image we see as a human being. But it only exists, we only exist in this form when we've been through that decoding process. In this book, uh, The Holographic Universe, great book where he pulls together, Michael Talbot, the uh, scientific information uh, supporting the idea that this is all a great hologram. Um, he tells a story in here, which is so brilliant. That's why I, I do tell it quite often, because it's so symbolic of what, what I'm talking about. He attended a party which his father um, had, and he had a state hypnotist along to do party tricks for the guests. There came a point where he, the hypnotist is dealing with this guy called Tom, and he said to him, he's doing through the tricks, and then he said to him, when I bring you back to a waking state, you're not going to be able to see your daughter in the room. At which point, the hypnotist led the daughter to stand right in front of the father who's looking in her belly. He brings him out of a waking, uh, to a waking state, or apparently so, and he says, Tom, can you see your daughter? Tom's looking around. No, I can't see her. She's giggling. He can't hear her. The hypnotist went behind the daughter, put his hand in the small of her back, and said, I'm holding something, Tom. What am I holding? He looked bemused because it was so obvious to him. He said, you're holding a watch. He says, there's an inscription on the uh, watch, Tom. Can you read it? He peered forward, read the inscription. His daughter standing between him and the watch. Now, from a left brain perspective, Professor Richard Dawkins at Oxford University or something, um, that's, that's impossible. You're one of these charlatans. But of course, from a left brain perspective, it's not possible. But when you realize the nature of reality, it is possible. Why? Because his daughter is an energetic... Uh, construct on, on that level, and unless his, her father decodes her energetic field into a holographic representation, he seizes her his daughter, she ain't going to exist in his reality. Everything else in the room is, because he's doing that to everything else. But the, the, the uh, hypnotist has implanted into the brain the belief that the daughter is not in the room, so just like... Um, in China, where they firewall off the internet, his brain gets firewalled off from decoding that field. So she doesn't come into holographic reality. She doesn't uh, occupy what we call space. He's going to be able to see what's behind her because in his reality, she ain't there on that frequency range we call um, the physical world. We think the world is physical. Let's come to that physical. Oh, it's so solid. Oh yeah, walk into a wall, bang, it's solid. Don't tell me it ain't solid. But it can't be. It can't be because it's, it's made of atoms, scientists tell us. And atoms have no solidity. How can a, uh, an atom that has no solidity make up this solid world? It can't. And it doesn't. Because the world isn't solid. This is why when scientists have this bewildered conundrum between... Uh, uh, non-physical atoms making up a physical world, how can it be? Well, I can help them out. There is no physical world to make up. The atoms are part of the decoding process 
of turning vibrational fields and vibrational um, information into holographic form in our heads or in our minds. We, we make holograms, of course, in studios like this one. And uh, for those who haven't come across it, what happens is you've got an object that you want to uh, do a holographic photograph of. You have a laser beam. Part of it um, is diverted across the uh, object you want to photograph. Part of the beam is uh, uh, taken away and hits this photographic film where it meets the other part of the beam carrying the vibrational information of the image. It's like two uh, waves in uh, water coming and colliding. When you have, uh, they call it interference, an interference pattern in um, holographic terms. When you throw two pebbles in uh, a pond, where the waves they make collide is a vibrational representation of those two stones their weight, their size, and where they dropped in relationship to each other. And that's the same principle as holographic film. It looks like fingerprints and stuff. It seems to have no uh, form, no clarity. But you then fire a laser beam at this, and bingo! An apparently three-dimensional image of what's been photographed appears before your eyes, appearing to occupy space, but not. These are all um, holograms. Some of them, the best ones, can look as solid as you and me. These are all holograms. With no space, no 3D, just the appearance of it. There's the queen, holographic um, photograph of the queen. Very appropriate when we get to the second half. <laughs> Queen's a lizard, you're mad. These, these are not very good holograms, but you see how they can appear three-dimensional. Planets. You know, we can have three-dimensional things now on computer games. And that's what we're doing. Taking vibrational information and decoding it into a holographic world that appears to be out there, but isn't. So, in a decoded state, this is what the world looks like. In an undecoded state, they are energetic vibrational fields. This reality has a number of levels, the coded and decoded levels. So we're living in a virtual reality game, basically, uh, of great sophistication. And when we know that, we can enjoy it. When we don't know that, we can become enslaved by it, and we have been. And scientists, it's funny you see, because these scientists, the left-brainers, there are now some real cutting-edge mainstream scientists in some uh, parts of the world who, who've opened up the right brain, and they're very impressive people. But, um, and they're starting to get this now. But the left-brainers, I mean, it's like, you know, you know in the um, pantomimes, where someone's standing on the stage, and someone, like a monster or something, comes behind them, and the audience is going, he's behind you! And they turn round, and the other person turns round with them, and they're going, isn't... There's nobody there. He's behind. It's like that with science, because they're trying to work out these realities. But of course, as they're trying to work it out, their brain is decoding it into a holographic, apparently solid world. But they can't get at it because everything they touch, everything they look at, boom, it's hologram. Boom, it's hologram. It's solid. It's real. So this is why scientists have to open their consciousness if they're going to get to the deep levels that we're talking about today. The other great um, uh, characteristic of a hologram is that every part of the hologram contains a smaller version of the whole. Extraordinary characteristic. So if you cut a holographic print, those wavy frequency fields, the interference pattern into four, and you fire a laser at the four pieces, you don't get a quarter size uh, part of the whole picture, you get a quarter-sized version of the whole picture. Everything is a smaller version of the whole. And that is why this works, and, and, and what it's based on, if people started to realize it. Things like reflexology, um, and acupuncture, and these other alternative forms of healing, 
They can find parts of the body, this is acu reflexology, acupuncture is the same, that re reflect in different parts of the body the bigger parts of the body so they can treat the heart from a point on the foot or the hand. Different parts of the ear, you can treat different parts of the body from a point on the ear. Of course you can. It has to be like that because the body is a hologram and so the ear is a smaller version of the whole in the way it works. We have this thing, this, this, this uh, line that people say, oh, everything's as above, so below. Yes, because it's a hologram. So, this is why the human energy field is mirrored by the Earth's energy field because it's a hologram. And every part of the whole, at all the different levels, is a smaller version of the whole. What we are living in is a holographic internet, as I call it. If you look at um, what we call the internet, which we use on our computers, the only place the internet exists in the form that we perceive the internet, websites and graphics and colors and texts, is on the computer screen. It's the only place it exists in that form. Everywhere else, it's, it's uh, electrical circuits, mathematics, on-off electrical signals, all the rest of it. Same with television. The only place that television exists as we perceive it is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's com uh, frequency fields, mathematics, and um, electrical systems. And it's the same with us. Jean Fourier, um, a Frenchman, um, he developed something called the Fourier transform which allowed pictures to be turned into frequency fields broadcast and then decoded into pictures. That's basically what our brain is doing on a vast, vastly more sophisticated level. So what is the matrix, this holographic internet we live in or think we live in, we are part of its projection, it is energetic information. That's what it is. And we decode that information, and what we decode and how we decode it decides our experienced reality. Decides what we um, experience. We are crystals, basically. And so often, of course, in receiver transmitting, you see the use of crystals. Um, the membrane of every cell, and we have trillions of them, is a crystalline substance. DNA is a crystalline um, substance. This is the membrane of um, a cell. And electrical uh, signals make these gates open and close, letting in what's good for the cell, keeping out what's bad for the cell, etc., etc. Which is why when we get involved in a disruptive electrical and electromagnetic situations, these can open and close at the wrong times and lead to ill health. But we are crystals and we are transmitter receivers of information. And this was an article on DNA that I read. From the characteristic form of this giant molecule, a wound double helix, the DNA represents an ideal electromagnetic antennae. Yes, of course it does. On one hand, it is elongated and thus a blade which can take up very well electrical pulses. On the other hand, seen from above, it is as the form of a ring and thus is a very magnetical antennae. Don Juan, I think his name was, the shaman source of the... Uh, Carlos Castaneda books, is quoted as saying this, we are perceivers, we are awareness, we are not objects, we have no solidity, we are boundless, we or rather our reason forget this and thus we entrap the totality of ourselves in a vicious circle from which we rarely emerge in our lifetime. And we don't do that because we're not meant to. Society is structured to keep us there. And these influences, programming information, sense of uh, belief, the poisons we get in food and drink, 
religions that mess with our minds and close down our awareness, uh, education and all this other stuff, medical drugs are affecting the decoding of this information, what we decode, how we decode it, and um, what range we decode. And at the level of the real manipulators, that's coldly, calculatedly done to put us in a vibrational prison we call a world. Bewildered world, going through it, what the hell is it all about? I don't understand. This is symbolic of the world we live in. For a body, computers. And we tap into this world wide web, you might call the cosmic internet, the holographic internet. And it's not, um, this is symbolic, the wires between them, because it ain't like that, it's like this. This Brixton Academy has um, wireless internet. It's here, everywhere, around us. We can't see it, it's not affecting uh, our perception at all. But if I tune this computer to that Wi-Fi wireless internet, on that screen will suddenly appear that internet, that reality. And what we're living in, where are we, is a holographic internet and that information exists everywhere around us and we're decoding it unknowingly, though not now, increasingly, into this reality we think is the world. And so you had that scene in the Matrix movie, the first one, where Morpheus says, the Matrix is everywhere. It's all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neil. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell, taste, or touch. A prison for your mind. And the matrix is everywhere because it is like a wireless internet which we're decoding. And we can decode vast areas of this internet. Or, as they do in China, that internet can be firewalled off so we only access that which suits those in control. And that's basically what's happened to us, not least through genetic manipulation. So what is reality? It's the frequency range that we are decoding and it's how we are decoding it. So when you've got miracles, there are no miracles. No such thing. There's only understanding reality more than you are when you perceive them as miracles. How can it be that you can walk through fire in a certain state of consciousness and not get burned, and you can walk through fire in another state of consciousness and be in the ambulance in 10 minutes? It's simply your connection, your interaction with reality is different. If you believe, and it's programmed into the software, that if you put your hand in fire it will burn, it will burn. But if you can go to another level of consciousness that's beyond that, then you can walk through fire and not get burned, as many people do. How can, how, that's not a miracle. It's just decoding reality in a different way. And we have the potential to decode a sod in paradise, which is why this has been kept from us. In the Matrix movie, there is no spoon. It is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself, exactly. Yes, I, I saw this. Where there is love, there is pain. Bollocks. <laughs> Bollocks! Only if you believe there is. We are looking at a world of people imprisoned by their own perception of reality. There they are. There they could be. As William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man and woman as it is, infinite. I think, therefore I am, said Descartes. I compute, therefore I am. 
on a body consciousness level. I am, therefore I am, in terms of infinite consciousness. That's who we are. What's your name? Everything you can ever think of. And uh, just go through this before. I've got kept a time well, purely by bloody accident, mine. Um, on one level, as I said earlier, this is a mathematical construct. This is one reason why things like numerology and numerological sequences are found all the time in um, secret society lore and stuff. Um, and if you look at the codes of DNA, they've got a very uh, digital mathematical feel about them. Same with uh, uh, DNA when you look at it. Um, uh, we are digital on one level. The earth grid, as above, so below. The earth is an energetic construct in the same way that we are, and it has um, a uh, structure of energy lines called ley lines, meridian lines, whatever. Um, and these um, are very uh, geometrical in the way that they are laid out. Again, mathematics, ge geometry. And, and uh, algebra, I like it, yeah. <laughs> The earth grid equals x, uh, y squared, and um, <laughs> x, y squared, where would that come from? I don't know. Anyway, so here's the, uh, the, the grid, and the lines are, are geometrical. And what um, uh, a lot of people have now, we've researched um, ancient um, uh, structures and temples and standing stones and what have you, they found that they are amazingly, stands back in amazement, in geometrical relationship to each other all over the world. How do they do that? Miraculous. No. If you have that ancient knowledge, and I'll come to that in the second half, or the second section, um, you know where these vortexes are. If you put a temple or a construction on that vortex, it is going to be in relationship geometrically to these other ones because you're putting it on a geometrically... Um, formed grid. And just like we have the chakra system of vortexes, so does the earth. And like I say, um, things like uh, Stonehenge and these great constructions of the ancient world were invariably put on these vortex points, which is where the geometrical relationship comes from. Also, because of this ancient knowledge I'll talk about um, when we've had a break, you find that uh, these great ancient constructions and temples and, and, and amazing uh, creations um, are using classic geometrical and mathematical codes like pi and golden mean, um, extraordinary. Also what comes up a lot is uh, the Fibonacci sequence of numbers which was um, attributed in terms of discovery, although it seems it was known long before, to this guy, Leonardo Pisano Fibonacci. I'm not sure, I think he was Italian, I'm not sure. And the Fibonacci sequence um, is you, you um, add the two numbers together to get the next one. And this sequence you find throughout nature and throughout the uh, formation and the relationships of parts of the human body and the human face, you find this Fibonacci sequence, because it, uh, th that's the mathematical construct level of reality manifesting itself. The same with how flowers grow and how flowers are formed. This Fibonacci sequence of numbers and mathematics uh, comes up again and again and again. Same with these other golden mean and pi stuff as well. So this guy, Stephen Marquant, an American doctor who studied the human face and the human body from, a, I think it was a point of view of... Um, cosmetic surgery, um, started to see this obvious correlation between these mathematical codes and sequences and the human body. And he said this, all life is biology, all biology is physiology, all physiology is chemistry, all chemistry is physics, and all physics is math, or maths as we say here. And he might have added, and all maths is energy, because that's the next level of it. We live um, in a uh, almost a mechanical construct on one level as it plays out and through things like, like money and, and other things the manipulators have introduced and controlled, they're controlling the way or influencing the way this construct operates and turning us 
into robots and parts of the machine when we are infinite consciousness. It's the same with um, astrology. When we're born at a certain time, uh, we pick up energetic vibrational fields that are around at that time that are affected by the, the relationship of the planets of that time, the sun at that time. And they can influence us because this affects our um, body consciousness auric field. And as we go through the sequences through our lives as the planets move, we are going to be affected by them in a different way to someone born at another time in the cycle who will carry a different vibrational field and therefore interact with the uh, planets in a different way. And these forces, these same forces, are what hold planets in the positions they're in. And when those forces change or move, so do the planets. So, as we finish this first section, what is reality? Whatever we believe it is, and more than that, given what we're going to talk about in the second section, whatever we are told to believe it is. This is the foundation of the conspiracy. And I've started with this because from that, as we move through the day, the way society is structured and the way that, that the whole system that we experience every day works starts to make dramatically more sense once we realize what we're dealing with and also have the knowledge that those in the shadows, not the bushes and people like that, the runs with the real power, they understand all this and they've structured society with that knowledge to control us through this knowledge. So it's not, the world is not controlled by men in dark suits sitting around a table. It's massively influenced by them because they're playing out this conspiracy. They're not the origins of it. This is where a lot of conspiracy researchers go so far and stop. They think this is it. It's the Bilderberg Group. It's the Council on Foreign Relations. It's the Freemasons. No, no. This is one level of it being played out. Behind that are the shadow people, the human shadow people, who operate behind the scenes, who control those people who are apparently in power and appear on the news and sign the legislation, but the real power's here. And they, in turn, are controlled by the other dimensional shadow people, which I'll get to big time in the second section. Quaint lizard. So, this is it. This is what it is. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. It is a mind game. And that's great news because we, with this knowledge and with the knowledge of who we are, the dramatic, infinite genius of who we are, can take that power back. Thank you very much. Thirty minutes.